Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let our gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is God's word. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ uh, through Fellowship City as elder and one of the pastors here. Um, this morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. Throughout history, songs as an art form have captured the essence of many emotions and experiences. Some songs have gone as far as capturing the essence about life from that song's perspective. If you know it, or if you know some of these songs or some of these lyrics, just join along with me as we go. The Beatles have a track, Yesterday, which has the lyrics, Yesterday, all oh, my troubles seem so far away. Okay, there we go. Louis Armstrong singing What a Wonderful World says, I see trees of green, red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yo. Yeah, okay. Michael Jackson says, singing healing, says, make it a better place for you and Whoa, yes, yes. Uh, Destiny's Child, Destiny's Child, singing Survivor, says... Okay, okay. I'm going to work harder. Okay, yes, okay. Bob Marley singing Three Little Birds says, Don't worry. Okay. It's going to be all right. Okay. Well, sometimes it doesn't always feel like everything is going to be all right. Sometimes all we seem to have is the worry. We build up anxiety. Anxiety meaning a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease about something with an uncertain outcome. We build up tension in ourselves when we focus on uncertain outcomes with a deep-rooted desire for control. Sometimes we have trauma. The lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. So WebMD says, if you've ever been through a highly stressful event or series of events, you've been through a traumatic experience. Sometimes the traumatic experience are enough to cause reactions in our minds that are associated with exhaustion, with confusion, with sadness, with agitation, numbness, and even disassociation. Anxiety, depression, hurt, and trauma are real experiences we, we feel and experience at one point or another. Sometimes through the experience of anxiety, of depression, of hurt, or trauma, we need to seek professional help. We need to get a medical checkup or see a psychologist or social worker or psychiatrist. Sometimes with the help of these doctors, these professionals, we may need medication to help us. God does work also through professional doctors and medicine as he does work through his word. Sometimes through experience of anxiety, of depression, of hurt or trauma, we need the help of scripture applying to our situation to help us navigate that anxiety, depression, hurt or trauma. This morning we will see the link to our mind and spiritual, uh, the, the, the link to our mind and spiritual or physical well-being. We will see the need for healing and transformation and the way in which we can be healed or transformed through the gospel. As we look at Ephesians 4, we will be reminded that indeed we are not alone. 
we'll be reminded that our mind needs to be hidden in the peace of God to help us through anxiety, to help us through sadness, to help us through disassociation. This is in spite of whether the situation we face stays the same or it changes. We will use a four-letter word, heal, borrowed and adapted from Pastor Derwin L. Gray. We will look at how we find gospel healing in Philippians 4 using four words from this word, heal. So the first one will be honesty. The H is for honesty. The E is for expect turbulence. The A is for acceptance. And the L is looking to God. These are four points this morning as we seek to find gospel healing through God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have the freedom and ability to come before your throne, to meet with brothers and sisters, to sing songs of praise and worship to you, to feel the Spirit move and the Spirit work and Spirit touch us. And we pray that at this point that the Spirit would be here and would be moving amongst us and helping us to focus on what you would desire for us to know to say and to do. Pray that you'd speak through my vocal cords those things that you want your people to know to say and to do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So short background about the letter. Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi. Philippi, if you picture it on a modern day map, uh, it's the second time, there is no map on screen, but picture it in your mind. Uh, It's modern day uh, Greece in Europe. the church was the first church planted in Europe. So Paul had a desire to be in Asia and visit some of the churches established there. He faces challenges in Asia while trying to continue visiting the churches in Asia. And in verse 9, we see while he's sleeping, he has a dream. The dream is of a Macedonian man. Macedonia was the northern part of Greece. The man was supposedly from that region, calling out to Paul. In the vision, the man pleads with Paul to come across the sea into Macedonia and to help them. To take the gospel to Macedonia, Paul departs listening to the work of the Holy Spirit guiding him. So Philippi is a major city in Macedonia, northern Greece, and a Roman colony where veteran Roman soldiers would reside. In Philippi, Paul meets Lydia, a businesswoman who sells expensive material or clothes, Uh, Paul casts out a spirit while in Macedonia, a a spirit that's in a slave girl. Because he casts out this um, spirit, he's then imprisoned uh, by the masters of that girl, Um, him along with Silas who's accompanying him. So they are arrested, and while they are in prison, Paul is continuing to teach the gospel and ultimately teaches the gospel to the jailer or the warder. When a earthquake happens, the doors are flung open. Paul and Silas remain where they are, postured and ready to share the gospel. This jailer sees what's happening, sees their calmness, and is open and willing to listen to them as they preach. And then Paul shares the gospel with the jailer and ultimately then with his family. So these are some of the things we see happen in, uh, in Philippi. And you can read all of this from Acts. So Acts 16 Uh, details what happened as Paul moves into this area. Finally, in verse 40, a a body of believers starts forming in the house of Lydia, the businesswoman. Paul leaves Philippi and continues establishing churches throughout Europe. Paul writes the letter to the Philippians a few letters on when he is in prison in Rome. So that's where he is currently, writes this letter This letter has a couple of themes around the main theme, which is Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, which is all about the humanity of Christ, the humility of Christ and his exaltation through his life, death, resurrection, and exaltation. So all the themes that Paul writes about are intended to be as a reflection of Jesus' story as a humble servant who will be exalted. Four to eleven, there are two main themes. Paul writes concerning joy and prayer, and writes concerning how they think and how they live. Joy and prayer, how they think and how they live. So we'll come to 
joy and prayer, think and live towards the end of our time here this morning. So just a quick overview of the text before we look at the word heal and how it looks and feels and fits into this picture. So Paul calls for restoration, for unity, mentions two women, Yodia and Syntyche. Both are part of the original church that met in Lydia's house. They likely were serving alongside Paul in his first visit as he mentions a partnership. The two women are at odds with one another in some form of disagreement publicly as well because Paul hears about this disagreement and writes to the church to speak to them through, the, through this letter. Paul mentions the book of life. Paul mentions unity, indicating that they are all Christians. They're all forgiven and accepted as children of God and should live in unity. Paul calls for a posture of rejoicing as well through all things, highlights bringing everything to God, communing with God all the time and having the peace of God as we commune with God. Paul also postures a picture of unity or family in mentioning brothers and sisters and encouraging them to be one in mind and to fix their thoughts on God so that his peace would be with them in all things. So as we look at our four points this morning, I want to lay some guardrails, um, something to help us as we grapple with this word heal as we look at Philippians. Firstly, anxiety, depression, hurt, and or trauma are real. Their real emotions and feelings we all go through at one point or another. They can develop in such a way that they're debilitating, where they stop us from seeing and believing the truth of the gospel, which has the power to heal. The debilitation can drive us into fear and into sin. So secondly, even though Philippians 4 does give us helpful tools to navigate anxiety and trauma and start to shape transformation and healing, Sometimes a journey with the help of trained professionals is also needed. In saying that, trained professional psychologists or psychiatrists help. They help. There is a difference between gospel healing and professional-based counseling healing. Professional-based counseling healing can help you manage your life better, but it does not transform the challenges you may be managing better. Let me say it this way as well. There's a difference between sin management, sin avoidance, and transformation. Sin management may be in the form of seeking help to manage habitual sin, which has taken root and debilitates, maybe something like addiction. Sin avoidance is just that, avoiding the problems, falsely believing you are in control, and transformation is emptying and or replacing the desires and perspectives of what brings us to the point of sin with the loving and gracious mercy of God. So professional-based counseling helps us to heal and to better manage the anxiety and trauma and hurt. But a gospel healing helps us to think about and meditate on the love and grace of God, which brings gospel healing. So we need professional-based counseling. God works through it. And as Christians, we should encourage one another to seek this form of help. But we also need gospel healing. We need the perspective of life, the perspective of finding comfort, joy, and strength in a loving and gracious God. Lastly, unresolved hurt, unattended anxiety, or habitual sin will harm the individual and the witness of the gospel. So we need to let the gospel heal and transform us. We can't talk or manage ourselves out of hurt and trauma. This is also particularly to those who serve. This isn't particularly for me as well. Serving doesn't help to heal. It may hide the need to heal, but it will unravel if we don't seek true restorative healing from whatever is bringing anxiety, depression, hurt, or trauma. So our first point, heal. In the word, heal is the H is for honesty. Human psychology and the different ways people deal with anything difficult is to prioritize emotional comfort and the immediate well-being over facing and engaging with potentially hard truths. This means there's a greater love in phrases like ignorance is bliss, or what, do you, what you don't know can't hurt you, or sweeping things under the rug, or moving on without closure, than there is in love for dealing with what brings emotional discomfort and hurt towards healing. We prioritize emotional comfort through avoidance rather than than mourning and finding real comfort through engaging the truth. Matthew 5 verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Sometimes we read this verse as, blessed are those who pull themselves up by their bootstraps, for they will be honored. Or blessed are those who keep going, for they will forget. Or blessed are those who are strong, for they will get their flowers today. Maybe I'm only preaching to myself this morning. Mourning means feeling regret or sadness about the loss or disappearance of something. It means not emotional comfort, but emotional discomfort as you work through the loss. Living through and facing the hurt, the anxiety and trauma. Some of you might not know, but since the birth of my eldest daughter as a family, we've had to face retrenchment unfairly and discrimination in a church where we served because of the color of our skin. This hurt us as a family. This was a traumatic experience. I moved on past the experience, I kept going, and I had to learn later on that not mourning or living in honesty doesn't provide emotional comfort as you think, but rather breeds more trauma and more hurt. It prolongs your hurt, and ultimately, I had to mourn as the pain and trauma keeps circling, for it is hidden. We have had to face mental illness as a family in the form of bipolar and chronic depression, the anxiety in the family gripping extended family levels and causing trauma. Honesty can be hard. Living in the emotional discomfort and hurt. Honesty saying this is hard. It's not avoiding the pain, not avoiding the anxiety or the trauma. Honesty is falling at the feet of the Father and crying out to God, laying it all down before God. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I know many of us sitting here would have thought that I was going to stop at present your request to God, because that's a verse you hear most. But it's not always followed by the truth. That's in verse 7. We often hear, present your requests and prayers and petitions before God. But we don't always hear, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. That is a comforting truth. Even though the season of mental health and bipolar, even through that season I picked myself up by my bootstraps instead of falling before the feet of God the Father with all the trauma and hurt to find comfort in Him to find perspective in him, to find healing and peace in him. The reason why we cannot manage ourselves out of past hurt or trauma or anxiety is because we then substitute the peace of God with a false peace of ourselves and a faulty understanding that will come back to hurt us. I had a false sense of peace that if I kept doing the things I needed, that everything would be okay. In my journey of healing from From that trauma, I learned that only the peace of God has the power to help me. If I ignore the trauma or just try to keep going, then I push forward more trauma and hurt. It still needs to be dealt with. We need to be honest about our anxiety. We need to be honest about our trauma. We need to be honest about our failures, honest about our unfulfilled promises, honest about our broken perspective of ourselves, honest about our failed relationships, honest about our broken family relationships, honest about the resentment we harbor, honest about broken hearts and spirits, honest about sin which debilitates us. We need to come before the Father and lay it before his feet. Just look at the Psalms. You see the Psalmist with such anguish, with much sadness, with much hurt and fear, or impending doom, but the Psalmist cries out to God cries out before God, putting all the emotions and feelings before God. Sometimes, fam, we come before God as if he doesn't know already or that he's shocked. We come unsure or holding half stories, not fully giving it all to God, as if he doesn't know. We come before God as we want to protect God from the truth. The Passion Translation of Philippians 4 verse 6 says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faithful request before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Yes, it says every detail of your life. 
We should bring every details of our lives before God. We should cry out to Him. We should lay our heart before Him. We do this through praying, through speaking to God and saying what is on our hearts and mind, laying it before His feet, all of it, every day, all the time. In Philippians, we know that there's, there's persecution in the Christians, of the Christians. This, hap- this is happening during first, Paul's first visit, and this continues to happen. This message is also fitting for them. Don't be troubled. Don't be anxious about what is happening. Don't ruminate, which means for a, for a long period thinking about something. Bring it before God. Find your rest in Him. Find peace that will guard your heart in Him. So first point, eight is for Honesty. Bring your prayer, petitions, anxiety, torment before God. Cry out to God the Father, expressing where you are. He is near, He is there, and He hears. Second point, expect turbulence. Turbulence meaning a violent or unsteady movement or moment. When I hear the word turbulence, I think of a flight. I think of the pilot on the intercom asking the passengers to fasten their seat belts as there's an expectation for some unsteady, violent movements. It is also movements and not a movement. So healing isn't a 100-meter sprint, but rather a marathon, which has different parts along the way. Being on a journey to healing and transformation may open up old wounds or repetitive spaces of dealing with the same thing. For the past three years as family, we've been dealing with bipolar and mental health. There are times when I look back at the family and see God's love and providence, where I see healing, and there are moments where there's still hurt and trauma, where there's still anxiety. I recently had the time to reflect on the spiritual journey, and it's not linear. It's not a 100-meter dash. It is a marathon where we have to keep coming back to God. We have to bring the hurt and the trauma before God in this journey of healing. The journey of healing includes personal reflection and sitting in the pain and confusion. It includes bringing it before God. It includes reflecting on it. It includes having lots of conversations, sometimes encouragement from other brothers and sisters in Christ, or even the other brothers and sisters in Christ mourning alongside you. It includes much prayer, much falling before the feet of God, sometimes multiple times, bringing the confusion, the hurt, the trauma before God. Philippians 4 verse 6b, the Passion Translation says, Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faithful requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell Him every detail of your life. Each day. Each day. Speak to God. Tell Him every detail of your life. Expecting turbulence means that you live in the fallenness of a broken world and expect that there will be hard times ahead. This is even more true if you're a child of God. The devil will remind you of the hurt and trauma and plant seeds of doubt over healing. The image of the plane where the pilot says, expect and brace for turbulence can be encouraging because even in that picture, in that thinking, there's other people around you that you're all bracing and expecting turbulence together. You are not alone. You're not alone even as you grip the armrests and plant your feet further in the ground as if it's going to stop the plane. You're not alone. Through turbulence, you need to be surrounded by people who love you and desire to speak life to you, who desire to encourage you, who desire to point you to the cross of Christ. First point, H is for honesty. Bring your prayer, petitions, anxiety, trauma, and hurt before God. Cry out to God the Father. Express where you are. He is near. He is there and He hears. Second point, expect turbulence. Healing is not a sprint, but it is a journey. Come before God through the journey, telling Him everything about the journey. Third point, acceptance. Accepting the hurt, anxiety, or trauma doesn't mean giving up or or, or being resigned to suffering. Doesn't mean that. It is recognizing and embracing your emotions as a necessary part of the human experience. The side of heaven, there is hurt, there is pain, there is suffering in a broken world we live in. Acceptance is an important part of the journey to healing. Resisting or denying painful emotions, anxiety, or trauma can intensify suffering and bondage, which results in more debilitation 
or alienation. Not accepting the anxiety, the trauma or hurt in trying to suppress the emotions doesn't make the anxiety, trauma or hurt go away. The truth is that sometimes we try to avoid things with the intention to make them go away. We fear that if we accept the, the hurt, the anxiety or the trauma, then we have to do something about it. We expose our hearts and minds in a fragile state, so we decide to avoid it. We find places to hide, hide in the work we do, in our hobbies, pushing ourselves to do more. But one of the first steps in solving a problem is accepting that there is one. You have to accept that there is hurt, that there is anxiety, that there is trauma, so that you can start the process towards healing. We need to come before God accepting the hurt, the trauma, the anxiety as something that is real. Listen to these lyrics from a We Will Worship song that helped me to put words to some of the hurt, pain, and confusion that I needed to deal with. This one The wilderness I'm feeling right now is real. But your presence is more real. Even though it doesn't make sense still, you are God over all my senses. God, your presence is more real. He goes on to speak about the giants that he's facing and says that they're real but your presence is more real. Here's something worthy of acceptance. As we accept the hurt, the trauma, the anxiety, as something that is real, an emotion that we feel, here's something else that is worthy of our acceptance. That even though what we feel and are going through is real, God's presence is real. Paul in Philippians calls us to rejoice in the Lord. Even if the situation doesn't change, we can and should rejoice. Paul calls us to rejoice. I know this is hard to fathom in the midst of anxiety or hurt or trauma. How can I rejoice if I'm anxious about my job? If I'm feeling overwhelmed by resentment? If I'm sick? If there's a growing medical bill? If I'm struggling to wake up in the morning? Or struggling to close my eyes because of hurt, confusion, or anxiety? Just remember the context to which Paul is writing this letter. He himself is in prison hoping to be released, but prepared to die and meet Christ. This is what Paul is facing. The Philippians are facing persecution for their beliefs and facing disunity within the church. Paul is urging them to bring their anxiety before God, but to still rejoice. Paul even says it twice, rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Paul here isn't speaking about purely being cheerful. Paul isn't saying someone can't be depressed or sad. Paul is speaking about something different when he's speaking about rejoicing. If we consider the book of Psalms again, when we see many personal Psalms where the psalmist is deeply sad and then even overwhelmed, but again we see the Psalms honestly lay bare on the pages of Scripture, their emotions before God, acknowledging their feelings before God, crying out to God in the process of being honest and crying out unto God the psalmist, by the end of the psalm, has a changed mood, has a renewed hope, even with unchanging circumstances. His presence is more real. Even if our senses don't understand or feel it, his presence is more real. Importantly, Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in the Lord for what he's already done and what he continues to do. The Lord is the author of the book of life. We see this in verse 3. He writes the name of those who are his children in the book of life. We are born objects of wrath, deserving to face the wrath of God. 
This is the result of the fall from Genesis 3. We desire to rule and be king over our own lives. We are blind and dead to our own faults. We can't fix our relationship with God because we cannot do any good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, but God who is rich in mercy dies for you and for me. Philippians 2, we see Jesus who is God emptying himself, taking the form of humanity by being born. He lives a perfect sinless life. Jesus becomes obedient to God by dying on the cross in our place. God opens our eyes to our dead state and our need for a savior. God enables us to repent and confess that Jesus is Lord and is exalted. This is how our names are written in the book of life. This is why we can rejoice. This is how we rejoice in the Lord, for the Lord has called us to himself and written our names in the book of life. We do nothing to deserve this free gift of life. It is God in his mercy and kindness giving us a beautiful gift of life and forgiveness. We have an eternal hope, a hope to one day meet Jesus in heaven. Here are some lyrics from a song, There is a Day. It says, there is a day that all creation is waiting for, a day of freedom and liberation from the earth. And on that day, the Lord will come to meet his bride. We are his bride. He will come to meet us. And when we see him, in an instant, we'll be changed. We'll be in our new bodies, meeting Christ. The trumpet sounds and the dead will then be raised by his power never to perish again. Once only flesh, now clothed with immortality. Death has now been swallowed up in victory. We will meet him in the air, and then we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Acceptance of the situation of the hurt of anxiety is recognizing the emotions and acknowledging the emotions, bringing it before God and surrender. It is accepting the truth of the gospel as the lens in which to see the hurt, anxiety, or trauma. Acceptance is remembering the truth of the gospel, that we have a hope of glory, One day we'll be with him, which should comfort and bring us peace. Peace is a state of tranquility or quietness of spirit that transcends circumstances. John 14 verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither neither let them be afraid. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus already paid the price for them. Only then can we have peace with God. This is enough to rejoice. In the next verse, Jesus says, Rejoice, for I'm going to be with the Father. We too one day will go and be with the Father. This is how Jesus gives us peace. Through his death and resurrection, we have peace with God. This is the initial peace we know. And as we grow in knowledge and a relationship with God, we experience more of his peace. We experience more of his peace. Here's the problem, fam. Sometimes we have an initial peace through redemption brought by Christ. Then we seek peace that we can control on our own. When we insist on being in control, we sabotage, God, we sabotage God's desire to clothe us with peace. When we pursue peace brought by our own sweat, work harder to have peace of living, study more to have peace of wisdom, have children to have peace of legacy. None of these things are bad in and of themselves. But if they are a hope, then we seek the wrong peace. And it's a peace that will not satisfy us. First point, H is for honesty. Bring your prayer, petitions, anxiety, trauma, and hurt before God. Cry out to God the Father, expressing where you are. He is near, he is there, and he hears. Second point, accept turbulence. Healing is not a sprint, but it is a journey. Come before God throughout the journey, telling him everything about the journey. Third point, acceptance. Acceptance Accept that there's hurt, that there's anxiety, there's trauma, there's depression. It's the first step to healing. Remember that there is a truth that is above what I feel, a truth that is more real, that his presence is more real. His salvation is bought by Christ for me, which is God's love and mercy for me, which is the peace of God available for me. Last point, look to God. There's a repeated word and theme, which is mind. So verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if these things are 
if, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Again, speaking about the mind. In order to continue on the journey to healing, we need to have our minds fixed on God, the author and perfect of our faith. Fam, our minds are extremely powerful. There's a concept called think, feel, and act cycle. This is, a, this is an abstract which explains this concept. Our brain is constantly thinking thoughts and making judgments about everything around us. Those judgments influence or create our emotions. Our emotions influence the way we act. And from our actions, we get, the resu- our, res- we get our results or outcomes. We can either have the peace of God guard our minds or have our minds captivated by the world and easily bound by the things of this world, stuck behind some of the things that stop us from meeting and encountering God. Sometimes we look to other things To help us, we hide behind our Netflix account or TikTok bookmarks or closed curtains, keeping us out of community and out of light. The hurt, anxiety, fear, depression is real. But the presence of God is more real. The promises of God are more real. The truth of God is more real. Tim Keller says, when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the ultimate darkness was coming down on him and he knew it was coming, He didn't abandon you. He died for you. If Jesus Christ didn't abandon you in his darkness, the ultimate darkness, why would he abandon you now in yours? To have the peace of God guard our minds means to saturate our minds with who God is. It's to have the Holy Spirit in us, empowering us to look to God. In the same way we remember all the lyrics of the songs we opened with, it is the same way we should remember the promises of God. The same excitement in uttering those lyrics is the same excitement we should have to proclaim the truth of God over our own lives. The peace of God comes and clothes us as as we renew our minds and are transformed by the word of God, are transformed by the Holy Spirit working in us, transformed by the truth of God in his grace and in his mercy. As God makes us new wine from the pressing, from the pressing of life, God makes us into who he wants us to be through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. As we close, I'm going to call the the worship team to come come up. Uh, As we close, God desires for us to be in relationship with him. He desires to see us grow in godliness. Sometimes we face anxiety, we face trauma, hurt, depression, or mental health which can be debilitating. This is when we need to find healing in the gospel. We need to come with honesty before God, bring our prayers, petitions, anxiety, trauma and hurt before God. We need to cry out to to God. We need to expect that there will be turbulence in this journey. Healing isn't a sprint, it is a journey, a journey we need to start to be healed. We need to accept that there's hurt, that there's anxiety, there's trauma, there's depression, so that we can start the journey of healing, so that we can bring it before God, so that the Holy Spirit can help us remember the truth about God, and the Holy Spirit can conform us more and more to the likeness of Christ. We need to look to God. If you don't know God this morning as Lord and Savior, as God who loves and sent his Son to die for you, as a God who heals and brings comfort, Maybe he's speaking to you now. And we'll pray for those who don't know him in a moment. Let's look at Colossians 3, verse 12 to 17. Verse 12 starts, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. 
Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bound of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We are God's chosen ones. If we have put our faith and trust in him, we are loved. God has forgiven us and his forgiveness is what should give us eternal peace. Even if the hurt, the depression, the trauma is a journey, today we can still know his eternal peace, his hope of glory. Colossians tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We do this by reading the word of God, by listening to his word taught, by listening to worship songs, listening to, to, to the songs and what they say, the lyrics of the songs. And this is a great way to find the words to express what you may be feeling or what is hard to articulate. Also a great way to find and remember the truth of the gospel, the truth of God. Songs like the goodness of God, because your goodness is running after me. Songs like new wine, to call out to God, to have his way, to do the work that he wants to do by the work of the Holy Spirit. We let the word of God dwell in our hearts by reading his word, by singing and listening to songs that teach us about God, by being in community so we're able to teach and admonish one another, to encourage one another. If you sense and feel that someone in your community isn't doing well, what are you doing about it? Are you coming around them? Are you praying for them? Are you encouraging them? Having the word of God dwell in us is how we can have gratitude in our hearts. We cannot have gratitude in our hearts if his word is not dwelling in us. How can we have an eternal perspective in the midst of anything we face? By letting his word dwell in our hearts. By being immersed in his word. That even as we expect trouble, we're putting on the arm of God. We're feasting on the word of God. We're listening to songs that bring bring us hope, that remind us of the promises of God. In Philippians, we find the themes of joy and prayer. Paul calls us to have joy, to rejoice in God because of who he is, because God is love. Because of his great mercy and love, he calls us to himself. He cries, he writes our name into the book of life. We ought to come before God. We ought to bring our prayers and petitions before God. We ought to bring our anxieties, hurt, and trauma before a loving God who desires to give us peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that transforms our mind. This is how we heal and receive spiritual transformation. We are honest before God. We accept turbulence. We are ready for the turbulence. We accept the situation, the hurt, the anxiety, the trauma. But more importantly, we accept the truth of God and the gospel, that he will never leave us nor forsake us that he will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We look to God, we will meet him in his word, and that word will transform us. Let's pray. If you are not a Christian this morning, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior and feel him tugging at your heart and calling you to himself, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to ask that you just repeat these words quietly in your heart as you remain seated. Thank you, and this is a prayer, so would repeat after me. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. Amen. We are going to have a moment of prayer. So I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask the worship team, we're going to sing Waymaker, and as we sing, you're welcome to stand, you're welcome to stay seated. If you're in need of prayer, as we sing and see these words on the screen, you're welcome to come forward or move towards the back, where you'll find people ready and willing to pray for you. Pray and ask God that he would continue to do a work in us, that he would make us who he would want us to be by the work and the power of his Holy Spirit. And those that are still in need of prayer, you're welcome to find someone that will be praying with you. There will be people at the back as well. But let's stand and sing together.